So what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about some of the key ideas in the random matrix theory arguments. So the most dangerous part about discussing random matrix theory is requiring students to remember their linear algebra. Yeah, I, for those of you at home who could not see the groans or the sighs, they happened. Okay, so we talked a little bit last time, and I know the last two minutes somehow faded out and were not recorded in terms of audio, about a matrix is a transformation written down in a basis. And if you change your basis, the matrix looks different, but the transformation is the same. What we care about is the transformation. What we care about is the eigenvalues. So if you had your choice of matrix, what kind of matrix would you choose? Square invertible matrix. Be more specific. Be more specific. Diagonal, right? <laughs> if you could, you would love to work with diagonal matrices. It is very easy to calculate the eigenvalues of diagonal matrices. It is very easy to calculate the spacings between eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix. <laughs> Almost any question you want to ask about the eigenvalues of diagonal matrices is fairly easy. The question is which matrices are diagonalizable? Sadly, not every matrix is diagonalizable. And so there's the big theme, the theme for you know, real symmetric matrices, complex Hermitian matrices, and in general, for normal operators, that if you know, n, n, Hermitian equals n, Hermitian n, then the matrix is diagonalizable. If there's strong interest, I'm happy to prove that. If not, I'm happy to just go with that and start talking a little bit about some of the properties of uh, diagonalizing matrices. So linear algebra view. So let's say we have some matrix A, and we can write it as Q transpose lambda Q. Q is orthogonal. Lambda is diagonal. And A will be real symmetric. I forget where Q transpose goes. Some people do Q lambda Q transpose. It doesn't really matter. It's a question of are you rotating your point or are you rotating your vector? Right? That's really the difference between Q and Q transpose. The physicists do it one way, the mathematicians do it another. I have taken classes from both of them and have absolutely no idea anymore which way things are supposed to be. And so I will do it somewhat arbitrarily. This means Q, Q transpose is Q transpose Q is the identity. You can, of course, develop the theory over complex emission matrices as well. You should have lots of lemmas from linear algebra, lots of theorems. I think the fundamental theorem of linear algebra is a bit pretentious. I don't really think it's as important as other things. To me, there is one result in linear algebra that is of fundamental importance in everything we're doing. Anybody know what that key result is? Eigenvalue trace, eigenvalue trace lemma. Excellent. Why do we care about the eigenvalue trace lemma? So eigenvalue trace lemma. The trace of A is the sum of lambda I of A. Why is this the lemma of linear algebra? Well, it's easy to see the diagonal entries. So in terms of computation, this is actually very nice. And that is a huge part of the answer, that this is computationally very easy to do. But what are we trying to understand? We're trying to understand the eigenvalues of our matrix. Well, if we're trying to understand the eigenvalues of our matrix, here's information about the eigenvalues. Here's information about the matrix elements. We choose the matrix elements at random. This is the bridge. So it's the bridge between the entries and the eigenvalues. There's a whole class of objects like this in mathematics that relate one thing you want to study to another, whole types of trace lemmas. Whenever you find these things, it's extremely important because it allows you to pass from knowledge of one area to knowledge of another. So what I thought I would do is rather than going through all the calculations in the book on random matrix theory, I thought I would just really emphasize the eigenvalue trace lemma. We have analogs of this. Where have we seen something like this before? Well, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it like that for now. Uh, let's just talk about the proof. How many of you remember the proof of the eigenvalue trace lemma? So, proof. K 
case one, A is diagonal. diagonal. Trivial. All right. So if you have a diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are the diagonal entries, the trace is the sum of the diagonal entries, it's not that hard. Okay? So in this situation, it's not so bad at all. Generally, there exists a T such that um, A equals, well, let's do it this way, T equals Q transpose AQ. Well, I guess I'm, you know, let, let me write it consistently with what I was doing before. So I'll write it as A equals Q transpose TQ where T is upper triangular. So what we're saying here is not that we can diagonalize the matrix, bless you, but that we can put the matrix into upper triangular form. So one of the big things in mathematics to keep track of is how much do you really need for the problem you're doing? It would be, of course, really nice if we had our matrix was diagonal. Is it enough to know that the matrix is triangular? So what are the eigenvalues of an upper triangular matrix? So if T equals, you know, T11, T, and N, star, and 0, what are the eigenvalues of T? So is it Gaspers the sum of the rows? Nope. It's just the diagonal entries. You know, if you take the vector 1, 0, 0, 0, you get t1 times 1, 0, 0. If you take the vector 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, it's a little bit more complicated now in terms of trying to find out what the eigenvalues are. But so if you want to find the eigenvalues, if you look at t minus lambda i, and you want the determinant of this to be 0, this is going to be t11 minus lambda dot 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 T and N minus lambda, blah, zero. And now, because I have all zeros down here when I expand this, I can expand about the first column, and I'll get T11 minus lambda, and everything else is a zero, times the smaller matrix. And so you're going to get that this is going to be T11 minus lambda, dot, 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 T and N minus lambda. Therefore, the lambda is T11 to TNN. So if you have an upper triangular matrix, the diagonal entries are just the eigenvalues. The eigenvectors are a little bit more work to find, but we don't really care about the eigenvectors for this problem. We only care about the eigenvalues. If I know my matrix is upper triangular, is it easy to prove the eigenvalue trace lemma? Yeah. So eigenvalue trace lemma follows. And the reason now follows is the trace is the sum of the main diagonal, and the sum of the eigenvalues is the main diagonal. So really, when we did case 1, A is diagonal, we could have really done case 1 prime, A is triangular. And that's a much better case one. If we prove it for upper triangular, lower triangular matrices, then as long as we can put a matrix into upper triangular form, we win. Do we need to have an orthogonal matrix here? No, we could actually weaken this a little bit. And in fact, all we need is some matrix S inverse and S. What do you know about the matrix S as soon as I write it like this? Invertible. It's invertible. <laughs> right? It has to be invertible because I'm writing S inverse, you know, TS. In particular, you know, T does, I'm sorry, in particular S doesn't have any zero eigenvalues. It has n linearly independent directions. Okay. So how many of you have seen the triangulization lemma? That if I give you a matrix, you can put it into upper triangular form. 
Does anybody want to see a proof of that? Or This is where you get to control the flow of the class. I'm happy to go back and do some standard linear algebra stuff, or just keep moving. Okay, I'll keep moving. So the idea here is that we don't need the full strength of the spectral theorem. We don't need the full strength of being able to convert a matrix to diagonal form. Putting into upper triangular form is close enough. And so as a nice exercise, think of how you would prove that you can triangulize any matrix. And the idea is that it's much nicer because it's not as strong of a statement. Since it's not as strong of a statement, it should hopefully be a little bit easier to prove. Remember, not every matrix is diagonalizable. So for instance, the matrix 0, 1, 0, 0 is not diagonalizable. And if you don't like the fact that we have zeros here, I could make these eights. Right? Not every matrix can be converted to a diagonal matrix by some kind of orthogonal transformation. The most general thing you have is called Jordan canonical form. And you'll have these block diagonal matrices where you'll have a main diagonal of you know, a constant eigenvalue, and then you'll have things off of it, you'll have generalized eigenvalues. Fortunately, with probability one, this never happens. Because in general, it's very hard to have a repeated root. When you have a characteristic polynomial, to have a repeated root, something's got to go wrong. And so you choose a matrix at random with probability 1, it has n distinct eigenvalues. If it has n distinct eigenvalues, you can diagonalize it. And what you do is you form a matrix S of you know, like V1 through Vn. And this is either S or S inverse, I forget which. Um, no, I think this is S. And then I think if you look at um, S inverse A... Right, I think this will now be a diagonal matrix. If I take the vector EI, S of EI is going to be VI. A of VI is going to become lambda I of VI. And then S inverse of VI is going to bring me back to EI. And so we've just shown that EI is an eigenvector of S inverse AS with eigenvalue lambda I. If I were to now dot it on the other side with EJ transpose, I would be getting the ijth entry of this matrix, and I would see it's 0 unless i equals j. So if I have n distinct eigenvalues, I can always diagonalize my matrix. OK, so we have the eigenvalue trace lemma. This is the start of what we need. We need a little bit more than just the standard eigenvalue trace lemma. So we know. The trace of A is the sum of lambda i of A. i goes from 1 to n. What is the trace of A to the k? So what would the trace of A to the k equal? There's the theorem, and then there's the trivial result that follows by definition almost. It's the sum of the eigenvalues of A to the K. And now this should be screaming at you to move the K outside the parentheses and say that this is the same as the sum I goes from 1 to N of lambda I of A to the K. So for this to be true, we just have to relate the eigenvalues of A to the eigenvalues of A to the K. Well. If a v equals lambda v, what's a to the k of v? So clearly, if lambda is an eigenvalue of a, lambda to the k is an eigenvalue of v. I'm sorry, lambda to the k is an eigenvalue of a to the k. The question is, could you get anything else? The question is, do you have things with the right multiplicities? This is not a proof. If the eigenvalues are all distinct, this is fine. But what if the eigenvalues are not distinct? Now again, everything works out properly. This is what goes on. But I just want you to be aware of what you need to prove. 
And so for something like this, you actually do have to do a little bit of work. This is a really good exercise if you want to check your linear algebra to prove that the eigenvalues of a to the k are the eigenvalues of a raised to the kth power. Is there anything on the board that might be useful for proving something like that? What might be useful? Putting things in upper triangular form. We know we can put any matrix into upper triangular form. We could, of course, do Jordan canonical form. For the most part, nobody wants to do Jordan canonical form. Upper triangular is very nice and easy to work with. And if you have an upper triangular matrix, if you raise it to the kth power, the main diagonal, the entries just get raised to the kth power. And the nice thing is, you know, S times S inverse, that's just the identity. So try to use, use triangular lemma. Okay, and so if you use the triangular lemma, you should be able to prove something like this. And now hopefully you can begin to see why we can make progress in random matrix theory. We want to understand the eigenvalues of A to the K. Well, we really want to understand the eigenvalues of A one at a time. We get them bundled together. So again, this is the advantage of teaching a graduate level class is I do not have to go through all the algebra. I can leave that to you to read, and I can step back, and I can really talk about the philosophy as to why these things work, why you want to try something like this. In an ideal world, you would have some machine that spits out the eigenvalues for you one at a time. If you can find something like that, I would love to see it. What we do is we get information bundled together, especially if you do anything with statistics. You get things bundled together. And the goal is to then pass from that to the knowledge of the individual items. And what we're going to do is we're going to use something called the method of moments. And I'm going to explain how that works. And the idea is if we have enough information bundled together, it's going to be very easy to figure out the eigenvalues. I have to just make one last remark before we leave and before I erase what's on the board, or I will have to yell at myself. I did one of the cardinal sins in applied mathematics. In pure mathematics, it's fine. How do we find the eigenvalues? How do we find the eigenvalues of our matrix? We looked at the characteristic polynomial. I don't want any of my students to ever accuse me of not reminding them that from a computational perspective, this is a nightmare. Okay, if you actually ever need to do, if any of you have ever needed to do anything with eigenvalues, you would never, ever, ever want to use this for any matrix of reasonable size. There's numerical stability issues. There's the size of, you know, if you expand everything out, it's n factorial terms. Even if you start playing games of, you know, simplifying the matrix, from a computational perspective, this is horrible. From a theoretical perspective, it's absolutely fine, and I have no problem using it. But I just don't want you to have, you know, a mistaken belief that, you know, this is a good way to proceed. Eigenvalues and traces. Yes? So is there going to be something like if you know the sum of all these values to the first power and you know the sum of all to the second power, you're going to know them? That's exactly, where we, that's exactly where we're going. So if I was feeling particularly generous, what, ma what size matrix would I give you? A one by one. All right. So let's say A is equal to A11. Okay? Can anybody diagonalize this matrix for me? All right. Let's explore the consequences of the eigenvalue trace lemma. Eigenvalue trace lemma. A11 equals lambda11. Okay, let's make things a little bit more complicated. All right. Let's say A now is A11, A12, A21, A22. And now our matrix lambda is lambda1, lambda2. Now it's not so clear what the eigenvalues are. But we can apply the eigenvalue trace lemma twice. So eigenvalue trace lemma 
when k equals 1, that gives us a11 plus a22 is lambda 1 plus lambda 2. And if we now apply the eigenvalue trace lemma when k equals 2, now it's a little bit more complicated as to what we get. It'll be the sum um, a So a i j a j i. And if we go through, and this will be lambda one squared plus lambda two squared. If you want, just call this alpha one, call this alpha two. We have two equations in two unknowns. Morally, what should be true? Morally, there should be a solution, right? You should be able to find the eigenvalues. Now, if my matrix is real symmetric, there has to be a solution, right? Because we can diagonalize the matrix. It does have enough eigenvalues. Do we have to worry about indeterminacy? Could there be multiple solutions? So as soon as we have something now of degree 2, you have to start worrying, I'm going to use the quadratic formula. Do you think there are two distinct solutions? What's your intuition tell you? You all agree, you know, we can solve for lambda 1 in terms of lambda 2, feed this in here. That's going to give us two solutions. Shouldn't there just be one solution? Be. There should be. So what's going? What's wrong? Maybe if you then like solve for the other lambda, the first equation, plug it in, you'll find where the two overlap, and that will be there'll be only be one answer that they overlap. Not quite. We don't necessarily know that the eigenvalues are symmetric. So I mean, I, I can solve, you know, lambda 1 equals alpha 1 minus lambda 2. And then from that, I get lambda 1 squared plus alpha 1 minus lambda 2 squared minus alpha 2 equals 0. This is going to give me two solutions. Shouldn't I only have one solution for lambda 1? What goes wrong? Or is everything OK? Oh good, I was able to sneak this past you. I claim that there's nothing wrong. What's lambda 1? So what's lambda 1? What do you know about lambda 1? We must know something about lambda 1. What is it? No. no. What, what do we know about lambda 1? It's a, it's a, I think you might say it's a, it's an eigenvalue. Which eigenvalue is lambda 1? What do you mean by first? The largest, the smallest? The eigenvalues of a real symmetric matrix are real. That's a nice fact about them. When you write lambda 1, is lambda 1, does that mean the smallest eigenvalue? Does it mean the largest eigenvalue? You can impose a, note, a convention like that. We have not imposed any convention on that. We have two choices for lambda 1. We have two eigenvalues. <laughs> right? We can flip them. Right? There's nothing to worry about. We should have two solutions. 
I don't know which one is lambda 1 and which one is lambda 2. Now, if you want to put in the additional convention that lambda 1 is the largest eigenvalue, so that lambda 1 is greater than or equal to lambda 2, then all of a sudden when we get over here, now we will know which solution to take and call lambda 1. Okay, but two solutions okay as the eigenvalues are unordered. So if we order the eigenvalues, then the game becomes completely different. But right now, since the eigenvalues are unordered, we should expect to get two solutions in general. And then this is the idea of you know, two equations, two unknowns. We can actually solve explicitly for lambda 1 and lambda 2 by using what gives us explicit formulas for lambda 1 and lambda 2? Quadratic, Quadratic formula. So get explicit solutions for lambda i via the quadratic formula. And again, unlike myself, you've all taken abstract algebra. Uh, how many of you are taking Galois theory now? Anyone taking Galois theory? Okay. One of the beautiful themes you will see in Galois theory, and I, I did take that class even though I never took abstract algebra, is if I give you a polynomial of degree 5 or higher with general coefficients, there is no nice way to write down the roots of the polynomial using just plus, minus, times, divide, you know, radicals in terms of the coefficients of the polynomial. We can't solve a general polynomial by radicals if it's of degree 5 and higher. What this means is we have a quadratic formula, we have a cubic formula, we have a quartic formula, and that's it. For a generic polynomial, we can't write down the roots in terms of the coefficients. But morally, you know, you have something going on in the background. And you have numerical ways to approximate this. So if I give you a 3 by 3 matrix, how many times do you think we need to use the eigenvalue trace lemma? Three times. And so, you know, the induction is fairly clear here. The number of eigenvalues you have, that's how many equations you need. And so if I give you an n by n matrix, if we calculate the first n values, the, you know, the trace of a, a squared, a cubed, all the way up to a to the n, that will allow us to solve exactly for lambda 1 through lambda n. And then what we do in general is if we look at an n by n matrix with n going to infinity, we calculate all of these. Okay. There's a nice way to interpret what we're doing. And so the interpretation is actually through probability. And so, you know, we're looking at the trace of a to the k. So over here, this is a nice polynomial of degree k. And the idea is polynomials of degree k and these coefficients, this is going to lead to calculations that can be done. It is amazing how great random matrix theory is at calculating these values. It turns out it all comes down to integrating polynomials times density functions. If you had to choose anything to integrate, if you're not thinking polynomials, you have no intuition of what you should want to integrate, right? You don't want hyperbolic functions, you don't want, you know, nasty exponentials, inverse trig functions, nice polynomials. Now it turns out when we do the integration, it's going to matter which terms contribute, there's going to be a lot of combinatorics that we're going to spend a lot of time discussing. But the fact of the matter is, it's all going to come down to integrating polynomials. We can integrate polynomials. The difficulty is the combinatorics that will tell us how often each combination appears. On the right-hand side, there's actually a way to interpret what goes on over here. I can view this as n ooh, sorry, times 1 over n, the sum i equals 1 to n, of lambda i of a to the k. And if you look at what's going on over here, I'm taking each eigenvalue and I'm assigning a weight of 1 over n, and we have n eigenvalues. Think of it as I have a probability distribution. If you have a probability distribution, you have to assign the total mass of 1 to your objects. 
You know, you can't assign a negative amount to anything. You can't assign anything greater than one. What kind of distribution are we having here if we're assigning a weight of one over n to everything? Uniform. So uniform distribution on the eigenvalues. And if you think about what this quantity is, I'm taking the kth power. This is just the expected value of, um, let's call it x to the k. And so we're really calculating moments here. Calculating moments where we have something supported on the eigenvalues. Is there an easy way to show that if you have distinct eigenvalues, then all these equations that you get will be linearly independent, and thus they'll be uniquely determined? Um, well, it'll be unique up to permutations. Well, because how do you know that like, some sum of lambda sub i to the k is always linearly independent from lambda sub i, the sum of lambda sub i to something other than k? Oh, that this is not the same as this yeah, equation? Okay. Right. I mean, part of it is coming back to, you know, like the Newton polynomials and seeing what's going on. If I square this, I get the same as this with the cross term of 2 lambda 1 lambda 2. Um, and then in general, it's, it's going to be like lower order polynomials and rules. I almost want to say it's coming from the fact that we, I'm not positive, that we know that it's diagonalizable. So there has to be a way to determine. And we can't have two different sets of eigenvalues at the end of the day. So in some sense, this is almost arguing on physical principles. It's always a little risky to do an argument like this. But we know it's diagonalizable. So we know this has to somehow determine. And it can't determine something other than this. But we do have the freedom to reorder. They do sometimes make arguments like this in physics. And they say that you know, the, the solution to this system of equations must have these properties because this is what we observe in the real world. That only works if your equations are truly modeling what goes on in the real world. If they're not exactly modeling, you can't make that argument. It can be a plausibility argument, but it's not a certainty. So what we have here is this goes back to what we were talking about on the first class on random matrix theory where I gave you a probability distribution and I said, it's not enough to know the moments. The moments don't always determine the probability distribution. They do if things are nice. This is going to be a situation where things are nice. And the idea is if we understand the moments, we should understand the probability distribution. What's the probability distribution? It's the location of the eigenvalues. And depending on what we're doing, it might be convenient not to look at the eigenvalues, but to look at the normalized eigenvalues. Why would we want to look at normalized eigenvalues? We want to compare apples and apples. As n gets larger and larger and larger, I don't want my scale to be changing just because the size of the matrix is changing. I want to somehow normalize things so that everything behaves on the same scale. And so this is where the central limit theorem, or weaker version, Chebyshev's theorem, is going to be very useful in terms of just giving us a sense of what goes on. And so you know, we talked a little bit about stuff like this back in chapter 8. And the idea is we want to have a rough idea of what is the size of the eigenvalues. So again, whenever you do problems like this, it's always what is the right scale. So we're going to go from lambda i of a to lambda i of a over c times n to the delta. And we need to figure out what to choose for c and what to choose for delta. If you could only know one parameter, C or delta, which would you rather know? Delta. delta. Excellent. Why would you rather know delta? Exponent. It's the exponent. It's telling us how it's growing in n. This is the important one. The C, this allows us to say things like Wigner's semicircle law rather than Wigner's semi-ellipse law or semi-elliptical law. In fact, that's exactly why, because we don't know, do you say semi-ellipse, semi-elliptical? How many of you have taken stats? Linear regressions? Which would you rather know, the slope of the line or the intercept, typically? 
the slope. You know, when you're going far out, you want to figure out where are you. That small little value in the beginning, a little bit of uncertainty there is not going to be huge. A bit of uncertainty in the slope, however, will have huge consequences. The slope is the more important one, typically. So here we really want to know delta. Delta is the one that's going to affect the shape of what happens. C just affects the scaling. You know, we're going to measure things in yards versus meters versus inches versus furlongs. Doesn't really matter too much. Okay? Okay. So now, what's the trace of A squared? I'll accept two answers. Some of the eigenvalues squared, so some lambda i of a squared. It's also the sum of a i j a j i i j go from one to n. Okay, so sum i equals one to n lambda i of a squared. So this is the eigenvalue trace lemma when k equals 2. This gives us a lot of information. We know for real symmetric matrices that these are real numbers. So their squares are non-negative. We can use this to calculate the average size of the eigenvalue squared. So if we look at the expected value of the sum of i, the sum of a j, a i j squared, What's the expected value of a sum? Sum of the expected values. This is the linearity. It's the sum of i, sum of a j, expected value of a i j squared. And now, typically, we choose our variables, we choose our random matrix elements from a probability distribution of mean 0, variance 1. So a i j drawn from a distribution with mean 0, variance 1. Well, that means the expected value of aij squared is 1. And the reason is this is the same as the expected value of aij minus the mean squared. So if we're choosing something from a distribution with mean 0, variance 1, the, the standard deviation being 1, the variance being 1, is the same as the expected value of aij squared is 1. So how big do we expect this sum to be? We expect this sum to be about how big? n squared. Now, how big do you expect the errors? n. So by, basically by central limit theorem, n, n if you want, n to the 1 plus epsilon, just give yourself a little protection. You know, there's a lot of nice results about you know, how large the value should be. It should be on the order of n. And this is just, you know, what's the variance of a sum? The variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. And then if we want the standard deviation, that would be the square root. So we would expect fluctuations of size square root of the variance. The variance here is going to be of size n squared. We'd expect this to be of size 1. All right, so we now expect this to be of size um, n squared. And then this should be basically equal to n times lambda i of a squared average. So at the end of the day, we get lambda i of a average should be about size square root of n. You know, I divide by n, I illegally take a square root through the averaging. But just as a nice heuristic, this tells us the scale that we should be looking at matrices. If I look at a 10 by 10 matrix, if I look at a 100 by 100 matrix, if I look at a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, the size of the eigenvalues should be roughly on the order of square root of the size of the matrix. So as the matrix grows, assuming I keep choosing the matrix elements from the same distribution randomly, this will tell me how fast I expect the matrix elements to grow. So that if I want to have something that's universal, 
I should divide by delta equals one half. So this implies we should take delta to be one half. And then as we've said, you know, c is not nearly as important. And we're not going to be able to figure out what c should be just by looking at this. Okay? So so far we've done a lot today. You know, we've done some basic linear algebra and seen how this all comes together. We still have five minutes. Uh, we've pieced together that we can use this method of moments so that if we understand the moments, we understand the eigenvalues. We know the right scale at which we understand the eigenvalues. So what I want to do is I want to just end by setting up you know, the key calculation that's going to be you know, Friday's lecture. And so now we have mu a of x. And sometimes I do an overkill with notation and I put a subscript n to remind myself it's an n by n matrix. It's not needed, but I'll put a mass of size 1 over n at each normalized eigenvalue. Some i goes from 1 to n of the Dirac delta functional of x minus lambda i of a over 2 square roots of n. So at this point, we don't know why we should be putting in a 2 other than everybody else seems to be putting in a 2. It's going to just give us a circle at the end of the day rather than an ellipse. The 2 is not important. The important fact is it's a square root of n coming from a delta equals 1 half. All right. Well, if we want to calculate moments, we can now do that. So um, the kth moment is going to be the integral of x to the k mu a n of x dx. And we'll go from minus infinity to infinity. All right, well, since I have a Dirac delta functional, every time x equals one of the normalized eigenvalues, I get 1, and I get 0 every other time. All right, well, actually, I don't get 1. I would get x to the k. So this is going to just become 1 over n, the sum i goes from 1 to n of lambda i of a over 2 square roots of n to the kth power. And we'll call this m sub k of a n. The kth moment of the matrix a, and I'm just going to keep that n floating around to just remind myself that this is n by n. I could, of course, put a subscript n on the matrix a. I don't really need it. As soon as I write down a, I've implicitly stated the size of my matrix. I just want to make it really clear so I don't forget. OK, so now when I'm looking at what goes on over here, this can be simplified. I'm going to get a 2 to the k. I'm going to get a n to the k halves. The key thing is I'm going to have a sum of the lambda i of a. What we can look at is we can look at the expected value of m k of a n. And we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to average over all matrices. So this would be integrating mk of a n times the probability of a dA. So for each matrix, I keep track of what's the probability I chose that matrix. And I weight this. And this will give me the average kth moment as I go over all my matrices. And the hope is that the average kth moment will converge to something nice as n gets large. And that, that will be the moment of a nice distribution. Any idea which distribution is going to be the moments of? Not Gaussian. Semicircle. That's why it's Wigner's semicircle law. So it's going to converge to the moments of a semicircle. Well, let's think about what's going on here. We can calculate this by using the expression above. This is how we calculate it, theoretically. From a practical perspective, this sucks because this involves the eigenvalues, and it's the eigenvalues we want to understand. What could we do to make this tractable? Put in terms of the trace. Put in terms of the trace. So it turns out this is the same as down below, we'll have a 2 to the k, n to the k halves plus 1, and then we'll have a trace of a to the k. And we put that in here. And when we put that in here, we're now going to get a polynomial of degree k. 
Over here now, we're going to have the probability of this matrix. This is going to become the product 1 less than equal to i, less than equal to j, less than equal to n of p a i j d a i j. And this is because we have a real symmetric matrix. Once we choose the main diagonal in the upper part, then the bottom part is done. So to calculate these average moments, all we have to do now is calculate this. This is a big all. This is more integration than you've probably ever done in your life. And if you think about n going off to infinity, you know, the number of integrals we have to do is n choose 2. So we have to do on the order of n squared over 2 integrations. That's a lot of integration to do. And this only gives us the average moment. The way the subject then would proceed rigorously is you show that most things are close to the average, and then you'll have some kind of convergence. So for instance, it's possible, uh, it's not going to happen, half the class gets 100, half the class gets a 0, half the class gets an A, half the class gets an E. For those of you watching this online, we're Williams, we don't believe in Fs. Okay? If I do that, is that the same as everybody gets a 50? In some respects, it's the same if you look at the total number of points earned. But if you look at terms of the actual behavior and maybe how happy things are, there's a huge difference between half the class getting 100 and half the class getting a 0 and everybody getting a 50. What you want to do is if you really want to see that most matrices have measures that are close to the semicircle, you need to control how close things are typically to the average moments. And that's where you use some advanced probability machinery that I'm not going to go into. All right, so this is a good place to stop, so we will stop.